This is Rockin' with Jam Man. This is with Chris. How do you say your last name? I do not know. We're going to do it really slowly because it's very difficult. It's Impel Iteri. So think of it this way, like the word compel, like I compel you to. So Impel and then I, like it. And then like a girl's name, Terry. So Impel I, Terry. Impel it Terry. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. You nailed it. Yeah. yeah, it's like the longest most difficult rock band name to say in the world. I guess we have that record. Yeah. Hey, well done. <laughs> um, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. We're actually working on a new record right now, even though we're promoting our anthology. How's life treating you? Um, it's treating us well, but it takes a lot of work. You know, when you're promoting like a new record, it's like you're doing interviews probably like six or seven hours a day. But at the same time, you're trying to do a record, which usually requires us to be in the studio for like 10 or 12 hours a day. So there's a lot of conflicts, but it's fun. And, you know, we always love making records. So, you know, the studio always treats us very well. Uh oh, doggy. Oh, no. <laughs> um, how did you convince everyone to name the band after you? Uh, well, good question. Um, I think it was our manager at the time when we did our very first album, you know, there was a history, especially with rock bands in Los Angeles in the late eighties. Um, you'd get a really amazing band together, right? Like great drummer, bass player, singer. And then what happened often, if you hadn't landed a major record deal yet, one of your guys would always get stolen by a bigger band who got a, like a major contract with a big label. And so, you know, that happened to us like two times. We lost the drummer. We lost a really cool bass player. And, you know, at that point, we started to build a following, like people that would come see our band. And, you know, every time we lost somebody, it seemed like it gave the band less credibility. Like, wait a minute, those guys are gone, so you can't keep calling it this name. So someone suggested use my last name because I was a big fan of bands like Van Halen, right? And I was young and I was like, okay, that's cool. Sounds fun to me. Didn't, I didn't think about how difficult the name was to say, um, but that's how it, how it happened. That's crazy, man. Yeah. yeah. I guess you uh, could have not just named the, the band Rock after Rob. Sounds that like would have been a better name. I told someone the other day we should have called the band In Rock. And you know what's funny? Um, so our singer, Rob Rock, that's his real birth name. People think it's like a stage name. That's actually her birth name, which is really funny. Seriously? Yeah, that's his real name. Wow. Yep, it's Robert, Al Robert Allen Rock. Hey, uh, have you guys ever worked with Rob's nephew, kid? Um, <laughs> are we talking about like Kid Rock? <laughs> <laughs> no, we haven't. Maybe we should. <laughs> 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 what happened with Rob uh, where you replaced him with uh, Graham Bonnet so when we did our stand in line record it was actually our second record in 1988 um, kind of like this is how the, the story happened um, we had released our first album it was just called the Impelitary Black EP and we started to get a lot of popularity especially in places like Europe and Japan um, we were in a lot of magazines, we won a lot of like readers poll and a lot of people started to take interest in our group. And I remember we, um, we got signed by Sony and relativity. These are record companies that signed us to a contract. And I remember we were getting ready to write for the full length album that would follow our impelitary black EP. And Rob, um, he decided that he wanted to go in a different direction. So he went to work with a, a really famous music producer named Dieter Dirks, who was out of Germany. And Dieter had produced like rock bands like the Scorpions. And so he left the band. And at that point, I was in trouble. It was like I basically had signed a record deal. The label wanted a new album and I didn't have a singer. So, you know, I remember years earlier, Graham Bonnet um, had a band called Alcatraz. It was after his band Rainbow. And it was really popular. And, you know, they had called and asked that if I'd be interested in replacing their guitar player at the time, who was a guy named Ingve Malmsteen. And um, anyways, we, we didn't do anything with that. But over the years, Graham Bonnet and I stayed friends. And we crossed paths. And he said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, well, I just lost my singer. So I don't know what I'm doing. And somehow we 
you know, we decided let's try to work together. And we did. And the first song we actually wrote was a song called Stand in Line. Um, and we did that record with Graham, which was really more of a tribute to Graham Bonnet. It really, it didn't almost feel like an Impelitary record because Impelitary is much more of a heavy metal band. Stand in Line was much more of a rock album that was kind of designed to sound like Rainbow, which was Graham's previous band. Um, but anyways, the record did really well. You know, we ended up on MTV, which at that time was this really big TV show that played music all day long and, you know, played a lot of famous bands. So that gave us a lot of notoriety and a lot of success. And then in Japan, we got really lucky and got really famous. Um, so that's kind of what happened and how we ended up with Graham Bonnet. Was this during Graham's Alcatraz days? It was actually after. So Graham Bonnet, I think, did three records with Alcatraz. And it was around the second or third record that he was doing for Alcatraz. Rob Rock and I was, were, were doing the Impelitary Black EP. Um, EP just stands for Extended Play. So instead of being a full length album, I think it had like four or five songs on it. Um, and so when Graham finished Alcatraz, which is about, I think, after his third record, that's when it was my time to do my next record, which became Stand in Line. Um, what was it like working with him? With Graham Bonnet? Yes. Well, so Graham Bonnet was a legendary heavy metal singer. He had played with a lot of famous guitar players. Like, I'm not sure who you're familiar with, but so he was in a band, Rainbow, which had this guitar player named Richie Blackmore. And Richie Blackmore was really famous. He influenced a lot of guitar players, including me. And then after Richie Blackmore, Graham Bonnet um, worked with a guitar player named Michael Schenker. And Michael Schenker was out of Germany. He was also a really well-known guitar player. And then Graham, after Michael Schenker group, he then did um, his band, which was, it was Graham's own band. It was called Alcatraz. And that's where they brought in this kid, Ingve Malmsteen, who was an amazing player. He became an instant guitar hero. Um, and then after Ingve, there was a guy named Steve Vai, who's a very popular guitar player as well. And then when Graham left Alcatraz and he joined Impelitary, then there was me. So, you know, Graham has kind of had a, um, a run with a lot of guitar players, but he's an amazing, talented singer. And why did you kick him out and let him uh, and let Rob back? Well, we really didn't kick Graham out. What was happening was, OK, so we had played um, some shows in Japan with Graham. And we were playing, I think our first show, we played a place called the Giant Stadium in Tokyo. Um, and I think it was like 65,000 people. It was a big rock festival that we did. And there were other famous artists like Billy Joel and all those people. So we played some concerts there. Um, the audiences really seemed to like our band a lot. So we came back to America and we started playing some shows. We played, um, the last show we did with Graham Bonnet was the San Jose Civic Auditorium was up near San Francisco. It was a very kind of well-known arena. And it was Impelitary and a band called the Pat Travers Band. And it was totally sold out. It was an amazing show. We played great and everything went well. And then Graham went, went back to Australia to be with his wife and family. And at that time he was having, he was having some fights, I think, with the wife. So um, I got a call from our management company and they said, hey, we have really good news. And we we're like, what? He said, you guys have the end of the Iron Maiden tour. So we were going to go out and play with the band Iron Maiden, um, starting in Florida, I believe, and do like a couple months with them. And we got a call from Graham saying that he wasn't going to come back because he was trying to save his marriage. And so really it was Graham that left. We didn't fire him. And so at that point, we had to get, you know, another singer. And thank God, Rob Rock at this time was now ready to come back. So that's how the whole story progressed. Was Rob nervous after this because he knew that you could replace him if he didn't listen to your commands? No, because I've never been the boss, you know, to be honest. So although the band is called Impelitary, it's a band. It's never been the Chris Impelitary ego solo guitar player show i've never been that guy and i've never wanted to be um impelitary are usually four or five band members and we contribute equally now i do write a lot of the music and rob writes all the lyrics and a vocal melody but our bass player writes all his own bass parts the same thing with our drummers so rob was never fearful because we needed him you know it's like we needed rob as much as he needed us right so it's really an equal contribution you know, no one one guy can replace the other. But which you ended up doing in bringing Graham back. 
Yeah, we did. But remember, that was because Rob had quit to go work with Dieter Dirk. So if Rob didn't quit, Rob certainly would have done the next record that Graham did. It was just fate that Rob wanted to follow his heart. And he just he thought this other thing that Dieter was doing might be a little bit bigger commercially. And at the time, some of the music Rob was listening to, it might have been more um, vocally oriented, maybe even a little bit more popular than what we were doing with Impelitary. Because we've always been almost on the border of thrash with, you know, with melody. So who was better, Rob or Graham? They're both amazing singers, you know. A good way to to do this is if you listen to Rob Rock, listen to like, okay, so right now we're promoting our new anthology album. The first two songs, the first song is called Victim of the System, and that's Rob Rock singing. Song number two on the first disc of the anthology is a song called Perfect Crime. That's Graham Bonnet. And it's interesting, you know, me and James, our bass player and our drummer, you know, we kind of bring all the music. We write all the music and then we have Rob or Graham sing over it. And if you listen to Victim of the System or Perfect Crime or any of the songs that Rob sing versus Graham, it's the same band writing the same music, but it's two completely different sounding vocalists and lyricists that make this amazing contribution that actually changes the sound of the band. So, but I actually love both of them very much. They're both great, you know. Um, if you had to pick one as the final singer, who are you keeping? The final singer? Well, it would it would have to be Rob Rock. I mean, Rob Rock has done the majority of the albums. He was always he was really like the the beginning of Impelitary was with Rob. And all the records around the ones that we did with Graham were also Rob. We actually only did two records with Graham bought it. We did Stand in Line, and then we did System X. And, and by the way, when I say this, when I'm choosing Rob, remember, I still love Graham. I think Graham is one of the greatest rock vocalists in history. I mean, he replaced Ronnie James Dio in, in Rainbow. I mean, Ronnie James Dio was this legendary, amazing, you know, heavy metal vocalist, and Graham replaced Ronnie. So that tells you how amazing, you know, Graham is. And he really is. He's a very talented singer. So I only have great things to say about him. But, you know, Graham Bonnet is a lot older than I am, you know, where Rob Rock, even though he's older than me as well, he's closer in age. So, you know, we get along a little bit more emotionally, you know, I can relate a little bit more. Um, would you ever tour and let them take turns singing? Like, let them Yeah, sing? that would be awesome. That would be, as a matter of fact, we did that in Japan. That was so cool. Um, if you go on to, I think someone posted a video on YouTube and it's impelitary stand in line and it's in Tokyo and it's probably about, um, gosh, I don't know, maybe 2018 or 2019 and Graham actually joins us and you have to probably speed up to about like a minute and 22 or a minute, 23 seconds. And Graham joins us again live on stage. And I remember the whole venue, everybody went crazy. They loved it. So I love your idea. That would be really cool. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite power metal bands is a band called Halloween. And they're doing that right now where they have their original singer and the replacement singer, and they both do it together live. And I love it. I think it's so cool. Um, then at the end of the tour, like the last stop, just set up a ring and have them fight for the job of the ultimate <laughs> thing. They can brawl out like a... <laughs> <laughs> throw a couple you know of bricks what? in there yeah. <laughs> you know what they're just they're two super really nice guys they wouldn't fight each other they're just too loving but but to be honest i mean they're both so equally talented they're both i mean i can't say enough great things about both of them i've worked and i've been around some amazing vocalists including people like ronnie dio not work with them but been around him in the studio um, I worked with a guy many, many years ago for a very short period of time named Glenn Hughes, another incredible voice. And so I've been fortunate enough to work, work or be around some of the greatest vocals, vocalists. And I think Rob Rock and Graham Bonnet are equally in those in that same kind of realm of people like Ronnie James Dio, Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden, Rob Halford. I would easily put Rob and Graham with them. Uh, so did you ever wish that Ricky uh, Rat the Ricky Ratman never came back to um, to keep the gig hosting Headbangers Ball. Do you wish? You know what? When I did Headbangers Ball, it was actually um, Adam 
was their their um their host and i loved adam he was awesome you know um i remember i think it was mtv flew me to new york city in 1988 and at that time um they had a host his first name was adam um he was really popular and the show was really big and it played every every kind of metal band like iron maiden judas priest it would even play impelitary um, plays bands like Motley Crue and all of that stuff and Guns N' Roses. And it was a really cool show. And then um, I think uh, Ricky, who I, I didn't know, I know he had a, a club in Los Angeles called the Cat House, I believe. So he was really in with a lot of bands. And But, you know, I, I, I really didn't know the guy. So, you know, I, I didn't, to be honest, I really didn't watch a lot of the shows after that. So, you know, I'm a little bit out of touch. Uh, what can we expect on this new album, Wake the Beast? um pure high energetic heavy metal you know it's kind of like we're slaying the beast with our music um it's basically about 20 something years of impelitary music it's kind of our fan favorites and the reason we're releasing this for in america and europe so for many years we were under contract where we couldn't release our music outside of specific countries right because the record companies own the rights so recently we attained those rights and now we can finally release everything worldwide. So, you know, what fans can expect, a lot of screaming vocals, um, hopefully a lot of great metal riffs, a lot of really technical, fast shredding guitar solos, a lot of classical influence, um, big production, you know, killer drummers. You know, we've had some of the best drummers play with Impelitary over the years and, you know, and they shine on these records. So, the music is, um, it's exciting. So if you like metal, this should be something for you. Um, is there any new tracks on there? No, no new songs. Only the stuff that we release solely, I think, in Japan and a few other continental countries in Europe, uh, meaning out of continental Europe. Um, but no, there's nothing new. And we didn't remaster the record because a lot of people, I don't want people to think we remix the record or remaster the record, which I think is dumb. The reason we didn't do that is because we got it right the first time. We worked with the best producers, engineers, mastering engineers. So we wanted to keep the authenticity of the sonic quality or the sound quality of our records, you know. So we didn't mess with it at all. We just compiled all of our fan favorite songs and got legal rights to release it. So that's what this is about. So three CDs, man, that is pretty crazy. That is a lot of tunes. It's a lot of music to absorb and a lot of notes. So you better like shredding guitar solos because otherwise it's going to be like, whoa, dude, you need some like Tylenol. <laughs> no, yeah, there's, there's a lot of music there. But you know what? It's really hard to choose which song to put on these anthologies because as a musician, you know, our songs become like children. You know, it's like you can't pick a favorite child. So for us, it's kind of like, you know, we love all of the songs and we let a lot of our fans around the world kind of give us their input of what they liked or what they didn't like. So most of the stuff on these records, what they told, at least what they tell us is our best music, you know? So, yeah. What's the plans for a release? A big party? Any big parties? Well, there's always a big party, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's right now, so this is a little odd for us because normally when we release a record, we immediately go to places like Japan on tour, we go to Europe and do big festivals or we'll do dates or whatever. So at this point, we're actually in the studio writing a new record. So today's a day off, which is cool, so I can do some interviews, um, but we're actually in a recording studio and we'll be in there probably for the next three or four months, you know, working constantly trying to come up with a great record. So we already have 12 songs written, some stuff's recorded already, and it's more, you know, it kind of sounds like our record Venom, which we did. It was two records ago. If you don't know, we did a record called Venom. And a lot of our fans liked it, really high energy. So we're doing something very sim similar to that. But this one has a lot more orchestration to it, you know. So what got you playing the guitar and when did you start? Um, so I started playing guitar at 12 years old. The reason I started, so when I was nine years old, my mom and dad died, unfortunately. So I lost my parents. And thank God, my grandparents were really young. And so, you know, they basically gave me a choice. I could live with them or I could, I guess, be out on the street. And But they did it in a loving way. So I ended up, you know, moving in with them. 
And my grandmother and grandfather thought, oh, I better, they better find an outlet for me, something that I can find passion. Oh, sorry, one second. Um, so basically, they, um, I remember they took me to a music store right and they basically showed me these guitars and i was like i never forget it there was like a black copy of a gibson les ball and a stratocaster on the wall and i remember my grandmother said choose one and i was like no way and i remember i chose the black les paul custom it was actually made by a company called cameo and it was like as soon as i touched it i knew this was going to be part of my life right and so then i started taking lessons and when i say taking lessons I took lessons for five or six years learning music theory. So you have to learn all the scales, time signatures, right? You had to learn all the, you know, the, all, you have to do all the classical training, all of that stuff. Um, and then, um, I don't know, I started listening to hard rock and heavy metal music. And then I got addicted to the point. I just, I never put it down. The guitar literally became a part of me. Please don't yell at your dog, please. <laughs> I love my dogs, not yell them. They're four, it's actually four of them. They're little ones. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's really cool. So your grandparents were like, check this out and you should try to do this. Like, this Yeah, cool. you know, originally I think I wanted to play drums, but my grandmother's like, no way. Because <laughs> she knew I'd be loud. I, I was always a loud, unruly child. What people don't know, so remember I told you the band is Impelitary. The first three letters, it's I as in Ice, M as in Mary, P as in Paul, which stands for Imp. Um, what imp stands for, I, I think it's, um, I don't know if it's in mythology or whatever, but it's actually an unruly child. Yeah, with, yeah, it, it, it's, it's like a, they're like little demons or something. Yeah, exactly. And that, and Rob Rock, that's what he says I am, <laughs> like this unruly child, you know. So the reality is, you know, the whole guitar playing thing, though, it did start with that. And, you know, I will always love my grandparents, you know, because they encouraged me to play guitar. And then it wasn't until, you know, after I saw the band Kiss and Van Halen, then I knew that's what I wanted to do with my life. So that's how it all began. What countries are your most famous? Which countries are your most famous? Um, well, certainly Japan, you know, and, and, you know, I don't like to use, I, I don't, I mean, well, when you say famous, have to be careful, right? So we're a heavy metal band. But you know who Metallic is, but you probably don't know who Impelitary is, right? Yeah. So yeah. the reality is we do have, I like to call them friends and family around the world that really love our band and have supported us. So there are places where we can go, like we just played um, about a year before the pandemic started. We went and we played a place in Korea. It was called the Busan Rock Festival. And it was it was our headlining show. So we headlined. And we played and about 30,000 people came to our concert to see us. So we go to certain places in the world and we play really big concerts and we have a lot of fans. We go to other places in the world and they don't know who we are. So, you know, the cool thing about being in our band, every day is an adventure and we're always trying to see if we can grow our audience, right? But, but the countries, it's always been places like Japan, um, obviously Korea, um, we played Barcelona Rock Fest in Spain, which I think Iron Maiden headlined that show. And um, we had a lot of fans there. I think we played in front of like 20,000 or 25,000 people. We played in Germany at the big festivals. A lot of fans there. Um, a, a lot of areas in Europe, very popular. In America, you know, we haven't done a lot here because they really, when I say they, the music industry really haven't embraced us. As a matter of fact, in many ways, we're kind of like the, we're, we're kind of like, I, I almost feel like sometimes we're black, blacklisted, right? Like, you know, I, I don't know what it is, like they just hate us, you know, but in Europe and Japan and those places, they seem to love us. So, you know, that it's, it's a hard question to say, where exactly are we the most popular? I would definitely say Japan is definitely probably the first place. I mean, it's crazy. Like in Japan, you're like one of the most famous artists. Like they're, they're like love you and everything. But like if you went to America, you can go to Walmart and Walmart, and nobody would care. Nobody would like. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You know, I mean, look there. If we do play concerts in America, and occasionally we will, we'll do shows or whatever. A lot of people come and see us, so we know we have a lot of fans in America. The challenge is how to reach them because you have a lot of like. There's a lot of um, great heavy metal 
um, like websites or radio stations. Um, but a lot of them, they ignore us, you know, and it's okay. I mean, I get it. If they don't like us, it's okay. We don't want to force them. But in Japan, yeah, they put us on covers of magazines. We're on their really popular, famous TV shows and they play our music on the radio and, you know, in certain places in Europe, the same thing. Um, in America, it's not like we're, we're not trying. We are, you know, but you can't force the industry to love you. If it doesn't embrace you, then you just have to keep working slowly at it. And that's what we do every day. Um, you won several awards for the best rock guitarist. That is insane, man. That is crazy. Well, you know, I, I have won a couple of awards for that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, it's really humbling. I, I do remember when we did we did a record called Screaming Symphony. It was many years ago. It was in 1996. And I remember we had a really famous rock producer named Michael Wagner who worked on that record with us. And Michael had done everybody from Metallica, Ozzy Osbourne, um, Motley Crue. I mean, he worked with everybody. And he really helped me capture my guitar tone on that record. So it sounded amazing. And I remember we did an instrumental called 17th Century Chicken Picking, which is kind of like playing like Mozart or Vivaldi it mixed with like heavy metal and country music, really weird. And I remember um, Burn Magazine and Burn Magazine in Japan, it's like the biggest heavy metal magazine. At one point, it was a really big metal magazine around the world. Um, and I remember, yeah, I, I remember I won the best rock guitarist in that magazine um, for that album. And so, you know, when that happens, it's really nice. It's humbling. It makes you feel like you're being appreciated for all the practice and all the work that we do. But to be honest, I mean, there is no greatest or best guitar player. You know, we're all just when, we, when I play my guitar, I'm just expressing my emotions through my instrument. So when you hear me play, you're hearing part of my personality. Right. It's like I'm speaking with my guitar. And so I do what I do. Right. And other guitar players do what they do. So I, I hope that kind of, you know, explains that, you know, again, I, I feel I always feel uncomfortable with the award thing because, you know, again, there is no greatest. There's no fastest. There's no the best. We're all just ourselves. You know, yeah. same thing with singers. We're all just different people. Exactly. And that's what's really cool about it. Look, some people love me and other people hate me. <laughs> you know, and that's cool. You know, I mean, some people love that I can play really fast and really technical and other people think I'm soulless and I, you know, <laughs> it sounds like an ice pick. So, you know, the reality is I think that when you're a musician and my advice always to young guitar players is find your voice and just be true to yourself. You know, the rest will follow. Are you guys playing any shows this year? Um, we're going to play concerts in 2023. Because right now, like I said, we're working on the new record and we can't interrupt that. So most likely we'll probably go out and tour in, in probably the summer of 2023. That's the plan. Um, what is it like touring after a pandemic? Well, because we've been doing the record right through the pandemic and going on for another five or six months, I don't know. We haven't done any shows since the pandemic. I can tell you a lot of my friends that are playing out there, I'll get messages from friends on the road and it looks like they're having a blast. You know, I, I know they're really happy to be out of the house or out of the studio, you know, it's very rewarding. Um, what is life like on the road for you? Well, when we tour, especially places like Japan and Europe, um, it's rewarding. It's fun. I actually like it. Um, the traveling part, you know, it's an adventure. So you have to treat it that way. It's not always easy, especially when you have to get on an airplane and fly for 12 hours to Japan or, or wherever. Um, but it is an adventure. The, the part that I love the most is getting on stage and playing in front of all of our fans. You know, that is, it's, it's rewarding. It's exciting. And that's why we do this, you know? So, um, I don't know how to answer that. It's just, it's hard work. Um, for some people it can be very draining or, or very, um, tiring because of the amount of travel, but for me, it's worth it because those two or three hours you get to play live, it's awesome. It's amazing walking up on stage. And, you know, we played in front of more than 30,000 people and we played for in front of 500 people, you know, and it's fun equally, you know. Um, what is on your rider? What's on your rider? What is on our rider? Let me see. Um, 
<laughs> well, you know, the band Van Halen years ago, I think they, they had on their rider, I think it was like no brown M&Ms. So we do the opposite. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. We basically allow all M&Ms. Um, what do we have? Rob Rock, our singer, he always has to have orange juice, right? For me, it's always like ginger ale Coke and probably Stella or whatever the beer is of choice, right? Um, we always have great catering, you know, food. You know, for me, I'm really boring. Our guys like to eat. I'm a vegetarian. So for me, you know, I'll end up eating like, you know, you know, broccoli and salad and weird stuff. The other guys, they want to eat, you know, salami and, you know, ham or whatever, you know. So we have a little bit of everything on that. And then what else do we have on our rider? Um, well, there's a lot of stuff, you know. We have our our demands and they're, they're sweet demands, but they're demands that we need, right? Like, you know, no one in our dressing room before showtime, right? Because that's our private place where we can kind of practice, Right make sure we're really good when we play live. Um, so yeah, those are the little things. Clean towels. <laughs> um, do you guys have a ritual before you guys go on stage at all? Yeah, we always have to practice and, and try to do at least one or two songs live in the dressing room. So our drummer has like a practice kit, like a practice pad kit. So, you know, he'll do that. I've got my practice amp, right? My bass player, James Pulley, he's got his practice amp. And we've got it to the point where Rob can sing over us, you know? And so we work, you know, like a couple songs just to really get the energy going. And then once we feel like, oh, we're playing great backstage, then we know as soon as, you know, we get our road manager comes back and says, all right, showtime. And they, you know, the flashlights go on and they walk us through the dark halls out into the arena or wherever we go, we know we're ready. So that's kind of the ritual. It's a fun one. What is your favorite memory from playing a show? Favorite memory? Um, you know, I got to be honest, it's actually a recent memory. So remember I told you we played a show at the Busan Rock Festival? So when we did that show, it was our first time playing in Korea. And I wasn't sure what to expect. And when we did the show, our bass player, James Pulley, he couldn't come with us because he had like a visa issue. So my friend, a really well-known bass player, his name's Rudy Sarzo. He played with like White Snake and Ozzy, and he's in a band now called Quiet Riot. So Rudy came, and I think he spent like two or three weeks learning all our music, rehearsed with us with, with us for like a week or two, and then we flew all the way to Korea to do the show. And I was really nervous because when you've never played a country and you're headlining, you don't know if anybody's going to come see you sh come see your show. And I remember when we walked up the staircase you know, which is how you get onto the big stage. As soon as we get towards the top of the stage, I remember Rudy looked over at me and we were like, wow. And we looked out and there were like 30,000 people. And it was incredible. And it was a great show. And one of the funnest moments I had, one of the things why it's a fond memory. So when I was a little kid, I was probably your age. I went and saw Ozzy Osbourne with a guitar player named Randy Rhodes, who was one of my favorite guitar players. And my friend who was playing with us, Rudy Sarza, was actually playing bass with Ozzy Osbourne. And I remember when we did the Busan Rock Festival, we played Crazy Train, right, as a fun cover. And I remember playing it in front of all these people and we were having fun and we were shredding and it just sounded great. And I remember looking over at Rudy thinking, oh, this is wild. I remember as a kid, I was watching you play with Ozzy playing Crazy Train with Randy Rhodes. And here you are on stage playing with Impelitary, playing Crazy Train in front of all these people. Really fun memory. Do you have any worst? Worst memories? Um, yeah, I don't remember where the venue is. It was like, I remember I played a venue and um, I think, I don't know if I didn't feel well. I remember I took like something. And I remember it was like, it was something prescribed, right? Like something a doctor would give you. And I took it. And I remember at first of all, oh, I feel okay. And then all of a sudden I can almost feel my hands. Like my hands went numb. And we were playing at some like, like a NAM show or in front of musicians or whatever. And I remember it went up and I smiled. And went, okay, great. We're ready to start. And all of a sudden within like three seconds, I couldn't feel my hands. And I was like, oh my God. And I was, and to so the whole show, I was struggling struggling just to you know get through the songs it was a horrible horrible night so the one thing i learned from that show is never again only stay in really good shape don't drink don't take any drugs or anything like that 
and you'll play really well. So that was a, it was a good lesson for me. Like, could you move your hands or no? I could barely move my hands. Like this? it was really, it was really hard to do all, like the, the fast soloing. I couldn't do the chords. You could get through the chord part. Right. But it was really hard. You know, it was like someone poisoned me. It was weird. Could you do stuff like this though? Like, yeah, I could probably do that. But remember what I'm doing, the hands are going like this. They're going really fast. Right. And they're playing a lot of notes. And if someone gave you something that's going to put you to sleep, right. And you lose that feeling. I just remember that was not fun, but it was a really good lesson. You know, once you play badly in front of people and I did it probably a couple of times in my career, you learn, don't do stupid stuff like that. Be in, make sure you take care of yourself. Make sure you stay healthy, right? Make sure you get a lot of sleep. Make sure you practice, right? Because after those shows, I don't think I ever had a bad show again. I always played really well because I make sure to take care of myself and I practice a lot. What is, uh, uh, what is next for you? What's next for us? Well, like I said, right now we're working on our new record. So the idea is to try to finish this record probably by the middle of 2023, um, probably release it um, somewhere around that time or hopefully in, no later than the summer of 2023 and then go on tour. So that's it. But right now, every day it's in a recording studio working on this new music. You know, it's hard because, you know, we're always trying to make the next record our best record. Right. And it's always challenging because we've made some really good records, you know, and so every um, every record that we we take on, it becomes a challenge for us. So right now we're just motivated to get through this and make the best possible music possible. How do my followers follow you? Uh oh, so so our website, if you can spell it, it's impelitary.net. So I don't run it. It's just the band website. So again, it's just impelitary.net. That's where people can find information on the band. They keep them watch our music videos, right? We don't do a lot with social media, which I know I, I, our managers want to kill us for that. You know, I know there's like an Instagram page. I think it just says Chris and Pelletary official. And I don't even know if we have the official badge thing. So we just started doing stuff where we kind of actively go on that in a Facebook thing. Um, but pretty much Impelitary Net is the website. And then, of course, there are tons of music videos on things like YouTube where you can watch like Impelitary Venom would be a good music video for you to see if you've never seen the band. Right. That would give you an idea of who we are or what we sound like. I see you guys have some cool merch. You guys are going to have to hook me up and send me some of your shirts. School I like started. where you're going with that. And I need some me. fresh gear. School just started, man. I need fresh gear. It's my third week. Fresh gear. I love it. <laughs> Wait a minute. Now, when you say it's your third week, third week, what? Back in school now? Uh, yes. How's that going? Very good. I'm very smart, and I'm doing very good. Only problem? Only two problems. I have two problems now. Way too much homework. Just stop. And <laughs> the sleeping schedule. They need to fix that, honestly. I pray to God they fix that. Uh, hey, for whatever it's worth, I will tell you. So even though I'm a heavy metal rock guitar player, I actually have a master's degree. I have an MBA, which is a master in business administration. And to be honest, I was never, I didn't really like school when I went, you know, as a matter of fact, I barely graduated high school because I was in a rock band and we were playing like in clubs, like five or six nights a week. So I barely made it out, but thank God I did. And then years after when we were touring, there'd be time where we were down and I was like, okay, I play my guitar all day long. Right. But I have a couple hours here and there where I could go do something. So I actually went to college. And then after I graduated my undergrad degree, then I went and got a master's degree just because I was curious. Right. And also I was big fans of people like Brian May, you know, the guitar player in queen. Like, I think he has the doctorate in astrophysics, which I thought, wow, that's incredible. That's a lot of math. And you have to be like, a mathematician, which, you know, again, is very challenging. And music, remember, music can be very mathematical. So so either way, hang in with school. School is actually very good. Yeah, I know. School is good. <laughs> but when you're really smart sometimes and you overdo the questions, it can get boring. But it always varies <laughs> on your turn. So you probably have a very high IQ. Yes, I do. And you get bored very easily, right? So some of the other people are chart 
are challenged, right? Trying to learn the curriculum and you basically already know it without trying. Yeah. It's really easy. <laughs> Sometimes if I don't know what it is, the teacher just tells me and I just have it locked while some mm-hmm. other people have to take a while and they have to do the lessons while I overdo it sometimes i so so what do you do then in those instances um i just do extra problems she just says sometimes when we do extra problems on our she says that we can do problems alone this is during math class and stuff Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. usually when i'm done i just use other problems i don't go ahead like really far ahead and i use i still kind of do uh homework in my class but it's very hard now because uh you gotta do your work because they always check so it's kind of hard to do but I always, <laughs> I always get it done yeah well that's awesome you know look for whatever it's worth you know you going to school versus when i went to school you have access to technology so you have a lot more information than we had when we were kids yeah. right which means you're going to be a lot smarter than we are right because you're developing your foundation right meaning technologically you have access to so much information that we never had right you know it's funny we didn't even have computers when i went to school they didn't exist yet now of course when i went to college yes then we finally had computers and when i got my master's degree i did it like um probably like 10 or 12 years ago so i did it at an older age but at this point we embraced technology which was really cool so i could see the difference of you know what people my age when we went to grade school it was like versus your age right which means you're going to be way smarter than us which is good the world needs people like you it just that the sad thing is school te- like technically can be useless because of technology now anybody can search anything up yes. anybody with phones yeah. and everything my uh, grand uh, my grandfather my, well, my papa he always says that his teacher used to always say you will never have a calculator on you always so but and he said well They were wrong because of your phone. It always has an instant calculator on it. Well, you know, it's funny. So when we had to do like um, statistics, right, in grad school. So initially they would want us to do a lot of the formulas with with basically pencil and paper. Right. And their point being is, all right, what if you're out in the middle of the ocean and you don't have a calculator, your phone is dead. Right. And you don't have anything to utilize other than a paper and a pen, right? And so I kind of understood it from that perspective that, yeah, it can be beneficial to learn, right, the basics and do it by hand first, right, just in the event. But I mean, for the most part, we're always around an area where there's electricity or power, right? For the most part, I guess, unless you're in the middle of the jungle, then it's a problem. (laughs) Yeah. Then you're gonna have to get a stick and a lot of mud so you can kind of write in the dirt. Yeah. Work out your formula, yeah. You're on death row, and it's time for a final meal. What's on the menu? On death row. Oh, okay, great. Apple turnovers, pizza, um, and Coke. You know you can get a buffet, right? You know, like, you can literally get any amount of food that you want. Yeah, that's, oh, you know what? But hang on, you know, outside of, you know, if I'm in death row outside of, you know, making sure I kiss my daughters, the wife, all that stuff. Um, can I have my guitar? No, no, you cannot have your guitar. Well, that doesn't work for me then. That sucks. You <laughs> so all I get is a meal. I can't play my guitar while I'm eating. No, you can, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe if you like really work at it and you really beg them, you maybe yeah. could get it. Just maybe, just maybe. Yeah. Awesome. So, so, um, my either my old vintage Charvel Stratocaster or my old vintage Fender Stratocaster, one of those two got to come with me. And then I'm, I'm basically having pizza, pizza with veggies on it, um, definitely apple turnover, and then uh, Coca Cola over ice. So, yeah, that's it. And then, and then if I'm on death row, if someone's going to shoot like some sort of poison in me, just make sure it's just like water. <laughs> that way I can come back from the dead. Um, I don't, do you want it to be the gas chambers? Uh, that would be a horrible way for death row. It, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun, no. Or no. you could just get shot where you don't have to feel really anything. It's just quick. <laughs> How about we avoid the death chamber How about we altogether? just avoid the death in general? Yeah. How about we just avoid it? <laughs> exa- well, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it's funny. Impelitary, the band, the metal band, we've been around so long. We're like cockroaches. We're probably going to outlast the 
entire human civilization. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we're not going to die anytime soon. And watch, as soon as you get off this, I get hit by a plane. <laughs> yeah, he's just like a plane. Freak plane. accident. <laughs> yeah. That would be funny. Crazy. And of course, I have my guitar somewhere around me. Crazy that Queen Elizabeth died. I know, isn't that? But you know what? She had a really good life. What was she, 98 years old? She was like, no, nah, she was like 97 or 96. Okay, but she's still, she was only a few years away from 100 years old. Can you imagine her life, how great it was? Yeah. She was, she right? ruled. I mean, she ruled Britain for like 70 years. She was a British monarch for 70 years. Yeah. Well, think about her experiences in life, right? all the various countries and the dignitaries that she got to have, you know, tea with, you know, all the knowledge she had, you know, plus she had a loving family, right? Definitely had some issues. Unfortunately, sadly, you know, her daughter-in-law, Diana, uh, died tragically. But, you know, beyond that, I mean, look, she was the queen. I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't know how it could be any cooler other than being in the rock band queen. So if you could ask me if I could be the Queen of England or be in the rock band queen, I'd be in the rock band queen playing guitar with Brian May. If you could choose any superpower, what would it be? Um, hmm. It's a good question, mate. What would be my superpower? Um, oh, I know. What? I would never need to sleep. I would have the energy I have now when I'm in the studio in the beginning of the day or we first go on stage, that energy would be there all the time. So I could be like in two places at once and yeah. never burn out. That's an interesting superpower. It's like not really like a, it is, it's actually a really good superpower. It just doesn't fit in like the super, wow. That really is a good superpower if you ask me. I, I think it is exactly. Just like pure energy, twenty four hours a day. So wait, but will you still sleep, or you would never? No, sleep? don't don't need to. Why? That's I can get a lot more. I can get a lot more done. Yeah. I can make more records. I can play more concerts. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so you asked. You know, I, I thought it'd be much cooler than just doing the traditional, hey, you want to be like Superman. Like, yeah, well, like, I, yeah, so, yeah. So you can, lift, you can lift heavy weights. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> but that's really interesting. That really is. Um, I thought that was kind of a cool one. Yeah, it really is. I'm not saying that it was bad. Don't think. How about you? Bad. What's your, let me ask, let's flip this, flip this coin. What's yours? Oh, just that, just that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> now if I, um. This one's really difficult, actually. Um, the power of creation. The power of creation. I'm like um. Like like you're God. Like no, you can I don't want to. I don't think of myself like that. Um, like Scarlet Witch, she has like reality mipple. Um, sorry, I can't say the word nation. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, but something like that. Not like a God superpower, but like. Mm -hmm. Some of these people, they get superpowers and their powers can just be crazy. But you want to create things with your superpower, right? Yes. Um, so here's the, here's a really cool thing. So are, do you play an instrument? The drums. I'm a Awesome. Okay. So have you ever created your own drum groove, right? Yeah. Do certain rudiments, right? Yeah, I Certain do. fills or whatever, create your own style. You are now creating something. It's just like us when we're in the studio or writing music or I'm writing a guitar solo. I'm creating something, right? Hopefully that's going to last forever. Same thing with you when you're playing drums. If you're playing something really cool, whether it's simple or it's really technical, you're creating something, you know? Your inner soul is speaking through your playing, through your, your drums, right? Let's just say that you could choose any song written by any band and you can change that song where you were the one who wrote it and sung it. Uh, well, you get what I mean. Um, what song would it be and why? What song would it be and why? Any song and, and basically that I that I could say I wrote. Like, and... like you get all the royalties and everything like that. Well, OK, but now you're thinking about money. I don't always think about that. No, I'm not thinking right? about the money. I'm just saying so, you get, like everything. You own everything. I got to be honest. I There's so many songs that I really, really love. One. Right. Um, so as far as like. All right. So if we think about rock music. 
rock music, I think my favorite band always was Van Halen. The, the ver- like the very first Van Halen record. The song that I love, my favorite song in that record was a song called I'm the One. I always loved that. It really influenced a lot of the stuff that I do, especially when I play solos. That and Spanish Fly, which was on the second Van Halen record. Um, but I also, when I think about songs that have really touched me, that are much more simplistic, I think there's a song called Smoke on the Water by a band called Deep Purple that Richie Blackmore, the guitar player, wrote. Remember I told yeah. you Graham dun, thing, dun, Richie dun, Blackmore? Dun, dun, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. I thought, what a great, simple riff, right? I love that. But then I also love, like, you know, um, The Four Seasons by Vivaldi. I would have loved to have written that or composed that. That would be a really cool one. So, yeah. Well, so you got you got that out of me. You got all right. So the four seasons written by Vivaldi. I would have composed that, written it, played it all. And then um, and then far as rock music it would be like I'm the one on the first Van Halen record, Spanish Fly on the second Van Halen record, and then probably Smoke on the Water. So oh, you got actually a couple songs. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I love that song. I do. Dun, dun. Yeah, it's a great song. It's magical. Absolutely. And it has an amazing, simplistic, but beautiful lyrical guitar solo. Yes. Even though I play all the really technical fast stuff, I love solos like that. It's slow and just nice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for being on my show. Hope the next time we talk at the backstage on one of your shows, dude, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Oh, dude, absolutely. And hang on. Sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't want to disappear, but this is Gizmo. Say hi to Gizmo. Yeah, Gizmo, Gizmo. Gizmo. Giz, Gizmo's been hanging out, rocking out with you guys. He's been like, come on, Chris, talk more about metal. <laughs> right? Yeah. He's a cool one. Oh, so, you yeah, hey, so, Jam Man, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate you having us on your, on your show. You are awesome. And remember, be cool, stay in school. Thank you, man. You have a nice night. All right. You too. Cheers. Yeah. Peace.